Today we're going to dive into one of the most commonly diagnosed functional GI disorders. Irritable bowel syndrome is a cluster of symptoms that have been given a really obvious name. So a patient goes to a doctor's office and they tell the doctor that they've got bloating, constipation, diarrhea, just overall discomfort. The doctor does some tests and then they give the patient the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. Now the patient thinks to themselves, I know I have an irritable bowel, I told you that. This is super frustrating from a patient's perspective. If you're just leaving a doctor's appointment with the same description of the symptoms that you experience, this really is just not enough. We need to figure out why these symptoms are present in the first place. Like I said before, conventional medicine believes that IBS is partially due to stress, anxiety, depression, and other mood disorders. But it turns out that IBS can have multiple causes. One of them is a disruption in the communication between the gut and the brain. Remember, the autonomic nervous system, which stems from the brain, is responsible for a lot of the motility. Motility is that movement that happens in the GI tract. When there's a kink in communication between the gut and the brain, the movement of the gut is altered, and we get symptoms of diarrhea or constipation, or alternating. Increased or decreased motility is the main cause for diarrhea or constipation. The faster your intestines move through, the less water that's absorbed from the food, and it results in loose stools. And if on the flip side, motility is slowed too much, then too much water is going to be absorbed over the intestinal lining, and you're left with those hard, rabbit-like pellets. It makes you feel constipated, like you haven't had a complete bowel movement, or you haven't fully voided. Infections in the gut can also cause a kink in communication between the gut and the brain. This means if you get food poisoning or you have traveler's diarrhea or you contract like giardia while you're camping, then you can change the way that your bowels move for years to come. You see, when you have an infection in your gut, your body produces antibodies to the toxin that the bacteria produces. The immune response that was mounted against the bacteria can lead to an autoimmune condition, where your body starts to produce antibodies to its own tissues, in this case, the nerves in the gut that regulate motility. I know that this is complicated, so I'm going to say it again. You get an infection, your immune system responds by making antibodies to the toxin that the bacteria produced, and somewhere along the road, your immune system gets confused. It goes haywire. And it makes a mistake and starts producing an antibody against your own nerves in the gut. Antivinculant antibodies are the antibodies found in some patients that have diarrhea-predominant IBS due to a past gut infection. So one in nine people who have had infectious diarrhea go on to develop post-infectious IBS. There's even a new blood test that's available that you can check to see if you have the antibodies present. This is called the IBS SMART test. In individuals who have had positive IBS smart tests and have diarrhea or loose stools, I typically use a natural product called immunoglobulins. This thing binds to toxins and bacteria in the intestines that are causing the diarrhea in the first place. Now, there's a prescription strength version called Interagam, and this is sometimes covered by insurance. There's also over-the-counter options for these immunoglobulins that can help with post-infectious IBS and diarrhea. You also need to support the immune system in these cases. When there's an infection in your gut, your immune system should be able to eliminate it without triggering the production of antibodies against your own tissues. So supporting the immune system with things like curcumin, vitamin D, vitamin A, as well as zinc, are essential in dealing with the root cause, an immune dysregulation. The other big cause for IBS is something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO. This is an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestines. It's believed that 76% of people with IBS actually have SIBO. The majority of our microbiome should be in our large intestines, the colon. But if the bacteria overgrows in the small intestines, then you can have symptoms like gas, bloating, diarrhea, or constipation. You see, your human cells actually don't produce any gas, but the bacteria do produce gas. They produce things like methane and hydrogen. When there's too many of the hydrogen or methane producing bacteria in your small intestines, then it can affect how your gut functions and your gut motility. Methane has been shown to slow down your gut, while on the flip side, hydrogen speeds up the motility, which can lead to diarrhea. Now, there's a test called the lactulose breath test. This is the main test for SIBO. 
During the test, you drink a sugary solution and then you breathe into several collection bags over a long period of time. The results show that if you have an increase in the concentration in methane or hydrogen producing bacteria, you'll have elevated levels of these gases. The typical treatment for SIBO are antibiotics like Zyfaxin and sometimes Neomycin. However, I never treat with just these antibiotics. I always do additional things. For instance, I'm always going to be using diet, exercise, lifestyle, as well as supplements. If you treat SIBO with antibiotics alone, then there's a really high reoccurrence rate. SIBO is kind of pesky, so you need to treat it from a few different angles. And you need to treat it way longer than just a two-week course of antibiotics. There's also an alternative to antibiotics. We have antimicrobial herbs in naturopathic medicine. Things like berberine, oregano, or grapefruit seed extract are really effective at treating SIBO. There's one natural supplement called Candibactin by a company called Metagenics, and this was actually found to be just as effective and possibly more effective than Zyfaxin. The study was done by John Hopkins University, and they found that the candibactin was slightly more effective than the antibiotic protocol. Now, there's also a diet that can be used to treat SIBO. It's called the low FODMAP diet. This cuts out certain carbohydrates that are easily fermented in the intestines and can cause excess gas production in people with SIBO. Some examples of high FODMAP foods from the diet are going to be things like bananas, honey, garlic, and blackberries. Now, it's really important to know that you should not be on a low FODMAP diet for the rest of your life. It's way too restrictive. A low FODMAP diet is used for the treatment of SIBO, not as a long-term solution. So if you've been on a low FODMAP diet for years, then you have not addressed the root cause. But if you've been diagnosed with SIBO, then have we found the root cause? Is that it? Not so much. SIBO is actually not the root cause. It's not the end of the story. When we talk about root cause in functional medicine, you usually keep asking the question, why? So in this case, why was there an overgrowth of bacteria in the first place? The answer is multifactorial, but motility is a big factor in SIBO. If you don't have regulated gut motility, then the bacteria that aren't being swept out by regular movements are way more apt to overgrow. You have a process in the small intestines called the migrating motor complex. This is one of the ways that we regulate motility in the intestines. The migrating motor complex is triggered after three to four hours of not eating. This is why limiting snacking can be really, really helpful in SIBO and other gut issues. So let's take for example, you eat breakfast and then you have a snack and then you have lunch and then you have a snack and then you have dinner. What happens there is you never trigger the migrating motor complex. The bacteria that should be continuously swept out by this migrating motor complex stay there and are much more apt to regrow and overgrow. Also, when methane and hydrogen levels are elevated, it causes a further disruption of motility and perpetuates the overgrowth even more. This is why we need to reduce the bacterial contents of the intestines with antimicrobial herbs in addition to regulating motility with compounds called prokinetics. So a prokinetic is an agent that increases or regulates gut motility. There is a new prescription prokinetic called Motegrity, and this stimulates contractions in the intestines and has been found to be really effective at treating SIBO. When I prescribe Motegrity, I'm actually using a fraction of the therapeutic dose, so I use a really low dose when I do this. There's also natural prokinetics, though, and I typically use these first. My favorite prokinetics for SIBO and just for constipation in general are things like ginger. So ginger is a really mild prokinetic that helps with motility, but it also helps with bloating. So ginger can be added to foods, it can be drank as a tea, but I use a therapeutic dose of ginger in capsule form to really help stimulate motility. Ginger also stimulates the secretion of pancreatic enzymes that help with digestion and prevent bloating and symptoms of SIBO or IBS. Another great natural prokinetic is a Chinese herbal combination called Six Gentlemen. You typically need a higher dose of Six Gentlemen for it to be effective, so you want to make sure you have a re really reliable source for it. Now the last natural prokinetic that I use for constipation and SIBO is D-limonene. D-limonene is found in the rind of lemons, oranges, and other citrus fruits. 
It's not only a mild prokinetic, but it's also an antibacterial and an antifungal, which makes it really helpful for SIBO. Okay, but I lied. There's one more natural prokinetic that I wanna talk about, but it's not a supplement. Walking, so walking stimulates the gut by stimulating the vagus nerve. Did you know that our ancestors actually walked over six miles each day? It's more than 12,000 steps per day. And the average American walks less than 5,000 steps per day. Walking is not only a fitness tool, but it also helps regulate our nervous system and stimulates our gut motility to prevent constipation and SIBO. Aiming for 10,000 steps per day is a goal and it's a great place to start. Walking after meals is also the best time because it helps with digestion and it also helps reduce your blood sugar levels. So you can reduce your blood sugar levels naturally by moving, things like walking. Your muscles are actually acting like a pump, putting sugars into your cells totally independent of insulin. This is also a great lifestyle change to prevent diabetes. You probably get the idea, but in terms of treating SIBO, motility is essential to get under control. If you have more of the constipation predominant symptoms, then it's even more important to get your bowels moving on a regular basis to prevent the overgrowth from coming back. So if you're not having one full bowel movement each day, then getting rid of SIBO is gonna be virtually impossible. I have a little trick though. So reacted magnesium or magnesium glycinate, these are two of my go-to supplements for people with constipation. This is ideal for people who have had for like those hard stools or feeling like you haven't gone to the bathroom fully because this means there's not enough water in your intestines. Magnesium actually works by pulling water into the colon to speed up motility and to help you void and, more, and feel like you have a complete bowel movement. Now, immune dysregulation is another piece of the puzzle in addition to motility. So your immune system produces something called secretory IgA. This is an immunoglobulin that helps to regulate the bacteria in your intestines. One of the roles of SIGA is to reduce the overgrowth of bacteria, which is really helpful in SIBO. If your immune system is not functioning properly, then you might not be able to produce enough SIGA for optimal gut health. Elevated cortisol levels, our stress hormone, can lead to low levels of SIGA and cause this whole cascade of overgrowth, dysregulated motility, and everything else we've talked about to be triggered as well. So reducing stress is a key part of treatment of SIBO. One study found that after just five days of mind-body meditation, subjects showed lower cortisol levels in response to mental stresses. And that's just after five days of meditation. Meditation takes time to get used to and it can be super frustrating. People often think that they're bad at meditating. But just remember, every time your mind wanders and you bring it back to center, whether you're focusing on your breath or focusing on something that you're grateful for, every time you bring it back to that centerpiece, it's a repetition, like a repetition at the gym when you're lifting a weight. You're literally exercising the brain to help rewire it. As humans, our natural tendency is to have a wandering brain that focuses on scanning the environment for potential threats or triggers. So stick with it and keep getting those repetitions in. My brain is still wandering and I've meditated for years and some days I get in a ton of repetitions. With SIBO and IBS, bloating and gas are really, really common. And while we want to treat the underlying cause of bacterial overgrowth and motility issues and immune dysregulation, it's also really important to feel better while you're treating it. So I'm gonna give you some tips to lowering that feeling of bloating or distension. Now, peppermint oil supplements are a great option to reducing the gas and bloating discomfort. I use these typically for people with more diarrhea predominant symptoms since peppermint can actually slow down the GI tract a little bit. Peppermint can cause reflux as well, so if you're prone to reflux, then you may want to avoid it or try something different for you. For people with more constipation, I typically will stick to the ginger, especially ginger capsules. Before we move on to testing, I wanna talk about a less recognized condition called CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. One study found that 26% of people with unexplained GI symptoms had an overgrowth of fungus in the small intestines. Now, fungus is actually a natural part of our gut ecosystem, just like bacteria, viruses, and all the other stuff that resides there. But just like the bacteria, if it overgrows, it can become problematic. SIFO can present with a variety of symptoms like diarrhea, belching, which is burping, bloating, indigestion, nausea, and gas. 
And unfortunately, there's no standardized tests for SIFO in conventional medicine, but we do have a couple options in functional medicine. Option one is a questionnaire that's been used in the research. It's called the Fungus Related Disease Questionnaire 7, or FRDQ7. It asks a series of kind of strange questions about antibiotic use as well as vaginal or penile discharge, even like eyes watering or red eyes as part of the questionnaire. And it's, it's pretty weird, but it's been validated by the research to be the most effective tool to correlate increased fungal growth with GI symptoms. This questionnaire has been included in your handouts today, so make sure to take a look at it. See if you can relate to any of these symptoms. I also usually ask women if they've had recurrent yeast infections, since the gut ecosystem has a big influence on the vaginal ecosystem. And in someone who has had recurrent yeast infections, I'm much more likely to suspect SIFO as a cause for their GI symptoms. There's also a test called the organic acids test, and this can screen for fungal overgrowth. We'll talk about this test in the advanced testing video to come. So if you score really high on the FRDQ7, or if you have a positive result on your organic acids test, then your doctor may put you on an antifungal treatment like niastatin, which is a medication. I also use a product called SF722. This is a natural antifungal supplement. We can talk about SIBO and SIFO all day long, but we have to talk about antacid medications when we talk about these two conditions. So things like Prilosec or Nexium. You see, these medications shut off the acid production in the stomach, and they're used to treat reflux, right? But when we shut off the acid production, we are also going to increase the pH of the stomach. And remember from Gut Health 101, the low stomach acid helps to keep bacterial levels at bay and also helps to kill pathogens. So the lack of stomach acid may actually be contributing to the development of SIBO and SIFO in the first place. And if you don't have enough stomach acid, it may make you more susceptible to GI conditions like Giardia that can increase your chances of getting post-infectious IBS. So we're gonna talk about reflux in an upcoming video. So if you're on these medications like Nexium or Prilosec and you have symptoms of IBS or SIBO, you need to make sure that you watch that video because you can't fix one without fixing the other. And regardless, if you've been on Prilosec or Nexium for more than eight weeks, then you need to talk to your doctor about tapering off of them. Now it's important to know if you actually have these things going on. So in the next video, we're gonna talk about all the testing options you have to figure out if SIBO or CIFO or IBS is something that you're dealing with. Now I wanna talk about the testing options for SIBO. These tests are also outlined in the handouts that you'll get today. So if you have symptoms of diarrhea, constipation, bloating, or a combination of these, then the first thing that you need to do is get a comprehensive workup by a doctor who specializes in gastrointestinal health. Your doctor might order additional tests based on your past medical history and your specific presentation, but these are kind of the must order, don't wanna miss tests. They'll run a complete blood count and a ferritin level on you to make sure that you're not iron deficient and you're not showing signs of infection. Now, iron deficiency is important to screen for because it could mean that you're losing blood from the GI tract, which would suggest a much more serious problem. They should also run a full thyroid panel, including TSH, free T3, free T4, antithyroglobulin antibodies, and antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. Running TSH alone is not sufficient. You need to make sure that your thyroid is producing the right amounts of thyroid hormones as well. If your thyroid is under-functioning, meaning that you have hypothyroidism, then you're much more prone to constipation, and if you don't have the ability to correct that hypothyroidism, then you're never gonna be able to treat SIBO or constipation-predominant IBS. On the flip side, if your TSH is too low or your thyroid hormones are elevated, then this is a sign of hyperthyroidism, and this can cause diarrhea. The other test is a comprehensive metabolic panel. This should be run to look at the liver and the gallbladder function that contributes to diarrhea and constipation. I also run a B12 level. This needs to be done to screen for malabsorption conditions that can be seen especially with diarrhea. So B12 is actually not the best measurement for your B12 levels, but a serum B12 is a good screening test just to look at are you absorbing your vitamins and nutrients. 
Methylmalonic acid is a more accurate way to measure your B12 levels. Vitamin D, this is also an essential test for any GI disorder because if you're deficient in vitamin D, then your immune system won't be functioning at full force. And if your symptoms are due to post-infectious IBS or SIBO, then it's essential to support the immune system to optimize your gut health with your vitamin levels. Now, C-reactive protein, also known as CRP, in addition to a sedimentation rate are general markers of inflammation that should be normal in IBS and SIBO. So if these are elevated, then your GI symptoms might be due to something else and a further workup is needed. Stool tests should also be run to rule out a parasite or an infection that might be causing the diarrhea or bloating. Giardia is actually one of the most common parasites in the United States, and this can sometimes show up as just bloating or diarrhea or a combination of the two. A celiac serology panel is a blood test and it's a genetic test that you can do to make sure that celiac disease is not the cause for your bloating and diarrhea. Celiac disease can even present as constipation sometimes. Diarrhea is not always the case. Celiac is when you have an allergy to gluten, a protein found in wheat, barley, rye, and other things. We'll talk about dietary changes for gut disorders in a future video, but it's not always necessary to remove gluten from your diet. I used to be on the 100% gluten-free bandwagon, but it looks like there are other dietary changes that can make or improve your IBS symptoms, as well as SIBO. Now, if you've been diagnosed with celiacs, then gluten is a must avoid for you. But there's also a condition called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. This is when you have a sensitivity to gluten and you have symptoms when you eat it, but you don't have celiac disease. I tell my patients to remove gluten for three months and see if your symptoms improve. If they do, then keep it out. It takes at least three months to see if this is going to improve your GI symptoms though. One week is definitely not enough to tell if a gluten-free diet will help you. Gluten-containing foods don't have any nutrients that you can't get from other vegetables or fruits, and most gluten-containing foods are processed anyways. I personally notice that when I take out gluten from my di diet, my cognitive function actually changes. I feel more clear and less brain fog. In the nutrition video, we'll discuss how a low FODMAP diet um, works for SIBO, what it is, and how it's been found to actually improve your IBS symptoms, even more so than a gluten-free diet. Okay, but dairy is a must eliminate for people with IBS. Dairy can cause both constipation as well as diarrhea. And dairy is also on my list of foods that pretty much every human should avoid. This one might be surprising, but nuts are another food group to avoid if you have IBS or SIBO. Nuts have fibers in them that can cause bloating, and sometimes taking nuts out of the diet is all you need to do to get rid of your bloating and distension. You might be thinking, but nuts are paleo, right? Like they're healthy and nuts are healthy and they have proteins and healthy fats in them. They also have things like selenium and zinc, but nuts in nature are usually in a shell and it takes a while to break the shell open. I say this because it means that we're likely only meant to eat a few of them at a time. So three tablespoons of almond butter or peanut butter would require a lot of gathering of nuts and cracking them. Over 15% of the population has IBS, and I'm guessing that number is actually a lot higher. Some people probably just write their symptoms off as normal or tolerable. While conventional medicine does screen for SIBO occasionally, I really believe that this is a much bigger cause for IBS than we once thought. And now that we know that fungal overgrowth can cause similar symptoms, we have so many more testing options to screen for the general GI complaints of bloating, diarrhea, and constipation. So if you've been treated for SIBO with Zyfaxin or Neomycin and your symptoms got better but then quickly returned, you need to know that there's still hope. A two-week treatment is rarely effective long-term and relapse rates or like flares and symptoms are very common with people with SIBO. My patients are put on a three-month treatment program at minimum and I use a combination of herbs, antibiotics, and prokinetics along with dietary changes and lifestyle factors. The other important thing to keep in mind is that Bacterial overgrowth is rarely the cause. Remember, impaired immune function that allows for the overgrowth to occur in the first place is typically one key piece. The other root cause of SIBO is issues with motility. When the migrating motor complex does not sweep out food and excess bacteria on a regular basis during the day, then your chances of SIBO increase dramatically. 
SIBO and SIFO are pretty pesky conditions, and they need to be treated pretty aggressively in most cases to get lasting results. So we covered a really big topic in this video, especially since IBS is one of the most common GI conditions. I really believe that a large majority of the people with IBS have some sort of dysbiosis or imbalance or overgrowth of bacteria. I also get really good results when I treat people for this overgrowth or dysbiosis, which speaks for itself. There are some other causes for loose stools besides SIBO and IBS, and we're gonna go over these in the next video, so stay tuned.